My name is Charlene Margo. I am co-founder of nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight, Dr. Bonnie halpern felscher from Stanford, who will be talking to you about Safety First, Empowering Teenagers to Prevent and Reduce Drug Use. Welcome, Bonnie halpern felscher Great. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully we are seeing it. Are Perfect. we good there, Charlene? All right. Fantastic. Well, good evening again, everyone. Excited to be here and talk to you about this very important topic. I'm going to get right into it uh, because I want to have as much time for information and conversation. A little heads up that I do have a couple of opportunities for you to chime in, and I would love for you to do that in the chat. Would love your thoughts as we go along. Also, um, in the Q&A, please do ask questions. I will follow along or Charlene and Bev will to make sure that I get all of your questions answered. Everything I'm talking about tonight are free resources that my REACH Lab offers for you. What does REACH Lab mean? Re REACH means research and education to empower adolescents and young adults to choose health. And thank you, Bev, has already put a lot of the links to our work in the chat for you. So our REACH Lab is um, at Stanford. And what our mission is, is to empower and promote adolescents and young adult health through collaborative research, education, and policy. We do this through conducting interdisciplinary high-impact research focused on adolescent and young adult health. If you're ever interested in any of our publications, you can find them on our website that Bev put into the chat, or just shoot me an email. I give my email at the end, and I'm always happy to provide you with our papers. We then translate the research that my lab and other labs do into effective prevention and intervention programs to reduce and prevent adolescent and young adult health-related risk behaviors. We also inform and support policies that improve adolescent young adult health. I've been, as, as Charlene said, involved in a number of city, county, state, and federal level advocacy efforts and policies, including getting uh, flavors out of tobacco products or not allowing flavored tobacco products to be sold and other such policies. And then the next, and then the final, well, not final, we do a lot in our lab, but the final here is to train the next generation of leaders in adolescent and young adult health and risk prevention. So if you have a youngster uh, who might be interested, we would um, certainly love to talk to you about uh, uh, either our programs or other programs that we work with. So I promise not to read all the names, but I always like to shout out my entire REACH lab because it takes a really, it takes a large, robust, interdisciplinary group to do the work that we do. And I think it's important for you to know and it gains trust in the work. So we are supported by public health researchers, a public health lawyer, uh, research coordinators, a couple of postdoctoral fellows, educators in the lab, a statistician, a psychiatrist, as an adolescent medicine physician, and then a full-time graphic designer to make everything pretty and bring it to you. We also have a wonderful youth action board. We have, this picture does not show everybody. We have 38 adolescents and young adults who work with us in everything that we do, whether it's doing research, doing advocacy work, or building and, and disseminating our curriculums. And a special thanks to our funders. All right, so let's get into it. I'm gonna talk briefly about adolescent drug use, not rates, not health effects. We, I do that in other talks and, and you're welcome to ask about that. But I wanted to give you an overview of adolescent drug use and then we'll spend the majority of time talking about how to keep young people safe in if and when they do encounter drugs. So I start with talking about the different drugs that are out there and only a few, I'm, I'm not gonna, bore you or go into everything, but there are just so many substances that adolescents are using now that, that we're concerned about. So first of all is the tobacco landscape. I've been doing tobacco prevention work for about 30 years now. And, you know, we started with the cigarettes, as you well know, and now more importantly, we're concerned about adolescent 
e-cigarette use. You might call it vaping. I call it e-cigarettes because they are a form of cigarettes, electronic cigarettes. Some people would say juuling, vaping, but they are a form of, they are nicotine and they're a form of tobacco products. That is the product that we're most concerned about right now in terms of the, the um, numbers of young people using anywhere from 10 to 25, 30%, depending on the data set that you look at. And the e-cigarettes that teens are using is changing almost daily. I can't keep up and, and I'm in this field. We went from sort of generic e-cigarettes to Juul to Puff Bar, now very popular views, Flume, Hide, and it's not no not by accident that they're called Hide, because these are products that are very difficult for parents, and most of you, I think, are parents, for you to find, because they don't look like a cigarette or a tobacco product. They look like ordinary household products, but I want you to be aware of what they are. So if you see these on your child's bookshelf, under their pillow, on this beside their bed in their backpack, you're aware of what they are. This is a picture taken of just some of the e-cigarette products that were confiscated from a school in the East Bay just recently. And you also notice that you've got mango and melon and um, blue raz and other things. These are recently captured despite the fact that California passed the Senate Bill 793, Prop 31 you may have voted for or not voted for, depending, um, something that I was very much an advocate for and testified on behalf of to get rid of flavors in tobacco products. It has had an effect, but we're still seeing teens and young adults be able to get these flavors because of illegal sales and so on. And it's very difficult to keep up with the products. Um, uh, just seeing what was in the chat, making sure nothing I needed to pay attention to. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Um, we know that uh, e-cigarettes were concerned. One is the enormous number of ingredients that are in there. I'm just going to highlight the nicotine by itself. You know, a jewel pod all the way up to the elf bar have 37 to almost 600 cigarettes worth of nicotine in these products. So it's a changing landscape that it's not surprising parents keep can't keep up. Again, I spend my life doing this work and it's very difficult to keep up with these products. We also have cannabis uh, right here. I'm not showing you pictures of all the different cannabis products, but just the names here. You know, uh, teens, teens don't call it cannabis, by the way. Uh, teens will call it marijuana. They'll generally call it weed. I tend to say pot. My kids laugh at me and say, you're so old school, mom. <clears throat> it's dank. Uh, broccoli, all different kinds of cannabis products. And teens and, and adults can smoke it in, in the form of a joint or a blunt, which is both tobacco and cannabis, THC. You can vape it, you can eat it, you can put it on your skin. There are just so many different ways. And again, really difficult to keep up with the different cannabis products. Not only that, but teenagers are combining and co-using cannabis and tobacco slash nicotine all the time. And this has been another issue. It's very, very difficult to, when you find uh, your, your son, your daughter, your child, or a student using, you may not always know what it is because of the vast proliferation and dual use of a lot of project products. Teens tell me that they take an e-cigarette product and they um, take an e-cigarette product and a uh, nicotine e-cigarette, vape half of it, and then put in cannabis oil, and now they have a cherry-flavored cannabis product or whatever it might be. And just like nicotine in the e-cigarettes, the THC concentration has gone up dramatically over the past few years. We've seen um, right now, if you were to take a joint or smoke a typical cannabis joint, you would be getting, if you just use one, about the equivalent of THC that you got from 10 joints when I was a teenager. So it is not your grandma's product anymore. It has gone up dramatically. And then you get dabbing, which is a highly concentrated THC, about 80% THC. So the cannabis young people you're using now are highly addictive, 
high, highly um, uh, psychoactive and really causing a lot of issues there. And again, we're not going into all the health effects today. I'm going to talk to you about a little different angle, but happy to have that conversation or point you to our curriculums that would talk about it. Now, not only can you vape or use e-cigarettes for nicotine and for cannabis, but you can vape caffeine, you can vape vitamins, you can vape melatonin, you can vape pretty much anything. And that's a big concern as well. Now, these products don't have nicotine, but they're very popular. We published a paper showing that 20 to 30% of teens and young adults are using these products. And no, they don't have nicotine. No, they don't have THC, but they have propylene glycol, glycerin, flavorants, metal, plastic that can get into your lungs and harm you. Not only that, but young people are using these products are more likely to go on and then use nicotine or THC vaping products. So there's the paper if you're interested um, um, in seeing how many teens are using these products. And then if that's not, not enough, we have oral nicotine products. We have Zin, which are pouches that you put in your gum, uh, in your cheek. We have Lucy gum. We have different tablets and lozenges. We have nicotine toothpicks. It's never ending, the number of uh, nicotine products and drugs that young people can get. And then I'd be remiss if, you know, ha having the mic for this hour, if I didn't mention fentanyl. Uh, this is something that was not a teenage issue as much as it was a young adult or an adult issue, but we are seeing more and more teens dying from fentanyl. And I want to make it clear, it's not teens who are using drugs all the time. It's not your stereotypical drug addict. It's a teen who was depressed or it's a teenager or a young adult who was in pain. And they think what they're doing is taking um, a pain pill or taking something to reduce their anxiety. And it's a fake pill, a fentapil, and it is laced with fentanyl. And they are unfortunately dying. And I've talked to a number of people and partnering with some parents who have lost their kids to fentanyl. There was a recent perspective by one of my colleagues, Scott Handlin at uh, Harvard. And what he said, or what their paper said, is every week in 20, 2022, the equivalent of a high school classroom's worth of students, an average of 22 students, died of a drug overdose. And it was mostly from fentanyl. 75% of the adolescents who died did so because of a product containing fentanyl. So why are teens using, given all the risks that we're talking about, everything that we're worried about, um, why is it that young people are using? Well, there are a lot of reasons. And, and again, that's another part of a talk, you know, that I'm not going to go into here, but you know, whether it's marketing or it's the flavors, or it's to look cool, it's depressed, whether they're depressed, whatever the reasons are, a lot of teens are using. But I want to talk about it in the, from the perspective of why youth are using, and therefore, how do we address it? How do we work with teens if our, we find out that our child or our student is using these drugs? Well, I am a developmental psychologist who studies adolescent decision-making, and if you go to the classic decision-making theories, <clears throat> they would say that adolescents take risks because they cannot judge appropriately the risks. They don't understand risks. They can't judge them. They believe that they're invulnerable to harm. They think they're pressured by peers or they are pressured by peers and they have more uh, very poor decision-making skills. That's what the theorists would say. I would say a lot of that's not correct because we've done studies showing that teens can judge risks. They believe, they know that risks exist. Yeah, they're pressured by peers, but it's more of a subtle pressure and they can make decisions. But what they put into the decision may be different. And I'll talk about that. But just to give you a little laughter, um, the three eyes of adolescence, that adolescents, when they make decisions, think they're invulnerable, invincible, and infertile. All right, but there really are real and perceived risks and benefits to using substances. We may not know that, we may not think about it, but there are real and there are perceived risks and benefits. And we tend to think, oh, no, 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 there are no benefits to using these. Yeah, there are. Teens like getting high, adults like getting high. They like the buzz, they like the flavors, they like looking cool. 
So when, and my research has shown this and others too, when we talk to a teen and a teen says, um, uh, when, we, when we talk to them and we say to them, just say no, N-O, just say no, don't use. It's very difficult for teens because they're saying, wait a second, you're telling me not to, but all my friends are pressuring me. And it's really difficult to say no. It is just as difficult for a teen to say no as it is for them to say yes. There are risks to a teenager to say no. Now, think about that. As an adult, we certainly would say, you know what? Dr drinking and driving is far more of an issue than not, you know, not doing so. We know the risks, although I will say, thankfully, teens are pretty good about not driving right now if they're under the influence. That's one thing teens have gotten the message on. But, you know, if you say to a teen, I sometimes equate it to sexual reproductive health behaviors, and you say to a teen, you can get an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, and a teen says, yeah, I know that, but I am more worried about keeping my boyfriend or girlfriend. Well, yeah, that's how teens think. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but we have to get into the, the heads of a teenager. There are real and perceived risks and benefits to using. So if you want to take a second, put into the chat, what are some good things that you can think about any drug? What is it? Throw some ideas into the chat. What are you thinking about? Anybody want to put anything into the chat? Thank you. So yeah, social lubricant, fun, help with anxiety, cuts boredom. Absolutely. Relative, uh, relieve anxiety, relaxation. All of these are exactly right to fit in. So you've I can, I can be done with my talk. You just figured it out. No, I'm kidding. But it's really important for you to realize and for us to think about it. Thank you. Wonderful things are in the chat. They help you sleep, which isn't true, by the way. Um, Self-medication for mental health, all these things. So if, imagine, and you probably have done this as a parent. I'm a parent of a 23 and 27-year-old. Your first thing that you want to say to them is don't use, period. Do not use. And then you want to say, if you use, bad things will happen. Well, guess what? The majority of teens get through this pretty well and you tell them don't use and they, and you, or you tell them if you use, you're going to die. If you use, and you could die, especially with fentanyl, but, or you use and you're going to crash your car, whatever. And then they don't, they do the behavior and bad things don't happen. You've lost your credibility. So when we talk to teens as a parent, when we talk to teens as an educator, we need to balance the perceived risks and benefits. I often say to teens, if you engage in X, whatever it is, Y may happen or it may not. But if it does, that's a bad thing. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not necessarily a perfect correlation, but let's be aware of the benefits and risks and perceptions that teens hold that we may need to be thinking about. All right. So just some things like you said, for alcohol, for example, socialization, more chatty, willing to dance or sing, karaoke, feel more confident, feel less nervous or anxious. Now with psychedelics, for example, it might be different. It might be a spiritual experience, existential crisis questions, access to the true self, change in mental health, whatever it might be. So there are some things that teens know, and this is true for adults too, but I'm a teen person, um, that they know and think about. So given all this, what can we do as parents, as educators, as healthcare providers, um, as, as uh, preventionists, whatever, and whoever you are, what are some things that we could do? Well, I would argue that we need to have honest drug education that's based in science, that's based on how adolescents supposed to be plural, sorry, how, how adolescents learn and how they actually make decisions. Teens do not make decisions by folding a piece of paper in half and say, what are the pros and what are the cons? We don't even make decisions that way. We may make them if we're buying a house or buying a car or if we're about to invest in something. But generally, we make kind of knee-jerk reactions or we have a conversation with somebody. We may weigh the risks and benefits, but not always. Teens are, are still capable of making decisions. They are. They think about these things a lot. What they put into the equation may differ from what we adults put into the equation. So we need to approach drug education knowing that and understanding teens. And ultimately, 
we need to keep teens safe, especially today, given fentanyl, given the high levels of nicotine with young people having um, lung collapses and other issues that are going on with cannabis and as high of THC as it is, we need to keep teens safe ultimately. So my new mantra is to say that we need to normalize drug education communication, not normalize drug use. By having a conversation, I'm hoping you all go home, or maybe you're taking this call from home, that you have a conversation. It's not a confrontation, it's a conversation. Talking to your kids about drugs does not get them to use. It does not. It does not normalize drug use. It normalizes honest communication. That's what we need to be doing. So I am going to present to you Safety First. This is a new uh, comprehensive drug education curriculum that, say, that my lab now has. We, we um, took it over from another group, uh, Drug Policy Alliance. It's now in my lab. We have uh, dramatically edited it, revised it and um, expanded it and contracted it de depending on which lesson and bringing it back out to all of you. It is now free and freely online. Safety First is a comprehensive harm reduction based drug intervention curriculum. It is certainly prevention, but it is also secondary prevention and intervention for young people who are using. Thank you, Bev, for putting the link in the chat. So when we talk about drug education and harm reduction drug education, how are we defining it? What do we mean? So I really want to make it clear that a harm reduction approach to drug education discourages young people from using it all. So it absolutely comes from the abstinence or don't use. It certainly we start there, but, but it offers more than that. It offers evidence-based information for teenagers to keep themselves and others safe if and <laughs> they can they encounter drugs in their schools, in their cars, at parties, or whatever it is. So most important is that we need to keep them safe. So safety first, our new safety first curriculum sees abstinence as important and primary in order to reduce drugs. And we say this throughout the entire curriculum. We say over and over and again, the most important and the best way to reduce your harm is not to use it all. But we wanna empower teens to make healthier choices through accurate information. We also recognize that some teens are using and will use drugs. If you go into a classroom or into, into your peer group or your, your child's peer group and you say, none of you are using, right? A teenager is not going to come back to you and say, no, 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 I am using mom. You have shut them down. Better is to say, I want to have a conversation. I want to tell you what I learned. Let's learn together. And by the way, son, daughter, if you are using, then let's talk about ways to keep you safe. And safe means ideally cutting back, ideally quitting. Second ideal is cutting back. And if you continue to use, let's keep you safe or let's get you help if you're addicted and, and struggling. And that's a really important message that we need to give to young people. If we approach it with you're not using and they are, they shut down and they don't listen to us anymore. Safety First does not encourage or condone drug use for anybody and particularly teens. We don't teach teens how to use, but we also don't judge teens. That is not our goal. In fact, we have a whole section on not stigmatizing people who are using drugs. So if you want to throw into the chat some of your thoughts about harm reduction, you might be terrified at this concept. You might like it. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Anybody want to talk about what you're seeing in your school or your community about drug use um, or in your, peer, your child's community? and any uh, biggest challenges that you might see. And I'll just give a minute uh, to see if anybody wants to put some of that information in the chat. Good thoughts, yeah. Um, to the comment about you worry that you don't know what your daughter does, um, you can monitor, you know, parents, and please keep those comments coming, thank you. Um, if, uh, you're seeing people uh, or you're not sure what your son or daughter or your child's doing, um, you know, you can monitor 
you can certainly make sure that they are not home alone without being supervised. I always say, and I always did with my own kids, I made sure that there was always a parent at any party they went to. Make sure that you have a conversation with them. But we're also not going to always know what they're doing. And that is why it's important to have the conversation with them to keep them as safe as possible and to tell them your expectations. Some people make um, contracts with their with their children. I expect you not to use, but if you are, here are the conditions. I would say to my kids when they were going out to a party when they were teenagers, I really hope you're not using drugs. I hope you're not drinking. But if you are, call me and I will come pick you up. And if I call you, and uh, if you call me and I pick you up, then you're not in trouble. But if you come home and you're drunk and you didn't call me and you were unsafe in doing so, then I, I would be upset and that they would be more in trouble. So, you know, having those honest conversations and setting clear expectations is really important. Um, and absolutely that we have to use and have more nuanced conversations. And it's important somebody put in there, harm reduction is great if somebody's using Harm reduction is also good if somebody's not using, but their um, but their friends are potentially using because the best way to help also is to have peers pull together to keep each other safe. Um, oh, drug testing. Um, I'm not a huge fan of drug testing, I will tell you, because a lot of times you get false positives and false negatives. Uh, but but you know. If, if you need to, uh, you cannot, by the way, you cannot have a healthcare provider test your kids for drugs. That is not allowed. Healthcare providers cannot um, do that because of the sensitive service laws, particularly in California. But, you know, if you want to use it, I'm just worried about false positive, false negatives. I'd rather, plus the trust issue that some of you are putting in here, I would love instead to see you have an honest conversation and set the expectations. Some great thoughts in there. I'm going to keep going and hopefully we'll have time at the end for a little bit more conversation. So let's get into safety first and talk a little bit more um, about it. Um, huh. Interesting that you're not seeing that they can help. I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. There are school resource officers who are using our curriculums as well. So what is safety first? Safety first is 13 lessons, about 50 minutes each, so about a class period. It's mostly geared towards high school students, but I will tell you that there are schools using it with middle school, and there are actually colleges using it. We are uh, creating a college version of Safety First, which won't be that different, a little bit fewer cutesy pictures and things, um, although people can tell me college students love the cuteness, but um, and then my goal is to have this as uh, used during the orientation week for all freshman college students. So we'll see. We're also probably going to make a middle school version of this as well. And again, we start with best way is not to use at all. But then we go into if you are using, keep you safe. So the 13 lessons include brain and addiction. Include, includes... Um, yeah, fifth grade. So our other curriculums, our um, vaping prevention curriculum and our cannabis prevention curriculum do go down as lo low as second or third grade. But safety first, we have to we have to do a little nuance to get it that young. So we go into brain and addiction, stress coping wellness. We do have lessons on alcohol, opioids and fentanyl, e-cigarettes, cannabis, hallucinogen and st stimulants. We talk about marketing as well, and I'm going to give you a little taste, um, no pun intended, on all of those. So the goals are absolutely to encourage youth not to use at all in the first place. We encourage youth who are using to stop or at least cut back or make alternative choices that are less risky. We provide straightforward science-based information. We explore the real and perceived risks and benefits of using drugs. And we prioritize safety through personal responsibility and knowledge. All of the safety first lessons include Canva slides. Um, I'm using, well, I'm not using Canva slides, but the, the images are similar to what we use. So they're very fresh. They're very cool. They're very pretty. And teens really like them. We have lots of activities in all of our lessons. We have discussion guides to continue the, the learning at home 
We have fact sheets. I'll show you a few of them. And cahoots we have for our other curriculums, and we are building cahoots for Safety First as well. So I'm going to just give you a whirlwind tour of each of the 13 lessons. So the first lesson is Introduction to Safety First. And by the way, if there are any educators, but also parents, we do have a pre and then a post survey that's built in to this. You can use it with your teenagers to see if they've learned something. You can use it for yourself to see if you've learned something. And then you can also use it within class uh, to see how, if you're moving the needle on adolescents' understanding, knowledge, and perceptions, and ultimately, hopefully, use. So lesson one is just an introduction to drug education, an introduction to drugs, an introduction to the information uh, that is in there. Um, then we go into keeping you safe. So lesson two, so you'll see the first few lessons cut across all drugs, no matter what the drug is. Um, and, then, and then we go into lessons that are specific to each drug. So lesson two is keeping you safe. This is our specific harm reduction. And let me tell you a little bit about the kinds of harm reduction we talk about. First, harm reduction, don't use. Again, don't use. If you are using, stop using. And this is an actual slide, by the way. I just um, did a screenshot of, all, of a few of our slides. If using, consider cutting down. We ask them to gain drug knowledge. Instead of saying no, N-O, it's say no, K-N-O-W. Somebody asked in the chat, if somebody's using, how do you get them to cut back? Sometimes it's it's not one solution. I feel for you parents who are having uh, your teenagers struggle with some sort of addiction. We don't want to do scare tactics. We do not use them. Scare tactics do not work. But honest information does. Look what your costs are. Look what could happen to you. Look how much it's costing you. Maybe we could do something better with your with your money. Um, it's it's teens um, want to be in control. If you tell them that they're no longer in control, then that sometimes helps us, them as well. And sometimes it just takes you as a parent, being that parent, to grab them and getting them into treatment as well, depending on where they are with their spectrum of addiction and drug use. We tell them it's important to know drug policies to look at the dose and dosage, I'll explain this, to consider the setting, to check the substance, not mix substances, and know how to respond in an emergency. So by dose and dosage, we're talking about how much, how often, and how long. So it's really important. And by the way, we talk about this not just with illicit drugs, with any drugs that's there. So for example, ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, a typical dose is 200 milligrams. But we know that you can go up, depending on the size of you, of the person, to around six to 800 milligrams if you're really, really, really needing it. But we say to teens, as an example, if 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, Advil, will relieve the pain, then start with that. Don't start with 600 milligrams or 800 or even 400. So only use as recommended. This is also important because we know that some teenagers are getting drugs out of their parents' cabinet. So that is one of the things that we really talk about. We talk about set and setting. Set, talking about someone's thoughts, someone's emotions. Setting, where are they? Are they driving? Are they in a dangerous place? Are they, oh, I, I knew of a teen, unfortunately, who fell, this was years ago, but was on drugs and fell off of a very high platform and died. So not using in situations where it simply can harm you. Watching out for drug alterations or adulterations. This is very common. This is what we're seeing a lot with fentanyl. So it could be cut with different drugs. We know this from our childhood, right? We saw with bleach and with other things. Now they're being cut with fentanyl. So we talk about checking the substance. There are substance checking strips. This looks like teens know how to use this now because this looks like COVID tests, right? This shouldn't scare anybody anymore. Now, these are not perfect. I want to make that really clear. If you're talking about fentanyl, for example, if it's a little fentanyl pill and you're only checking the right side of the pill, but it's the left side that has the fentanyl, you may not realize that there's fentanyl in there. So it is not perfect. It is by far, but it's still better than nothing if a young person is going to be using. 
So we definitely argue for the checking the substance. We have a really cool activity in there. You could do this parents, you could do this uh, teachers, counselors, you get two pictures, ideally identical, you know, get 50 cents pictures from somewhere, fill them both with water. You want to put a little lemon in there, whatever, put sugar in one, salt in the other, mix them well, and the teens can't tell the difference. And that's part of the, the point that you're making is you don't know what it is. You cannot tell what it is just by the color, the smell, or the look of it. And that helps them understand. And teens love that. We tell te teens don't mix drugs. You really don't know how harmful it might be. And again, these are the general. We then go into the specific not mixing of specific drugs within each of the drug categories of lessons. And we talk about how to respond in an emergency. We say, don't be afraid to call 911. Don't be afraid to seek medical help. We talk about, talk about Good Samaritan laws. You may not know this yourself. I actually only recently really understood this. So if you um, are in a situation where somebody has passed out, you call 911. If there are drugs around you, and this is for teens too, it doesn't matter if you're under 18 or under 21. If there are drugs around you, the police should not, by law, they will not arrest you. They will not bust you. They might confiscate the drugs, and that's okay, but they will not arrest you. The point is, under Good Samaritan laws in California and in many states, but our California laws are particularly good, it protects you because most important is that you call 911 and get the help that person needs. I checked this with some school resource officers who said, yes, that is the case. They might confiscate, but they will not arrest you. So that's something we need to tell kids about because unfortunately too many young people are dying or getting really injured or ill because people are afraid to call 911 because they're afraid that they'll get in trouble. So this is something that we really have to have a conversation about. Somebody mentioned motivational interviewing. Thank you, yes. And we actually have motivational interviewing in our other curriculum. Uh, healthy futures to help young people quit. So we have a whole lesson for young people who are using, particularly nicotine or THC, but you can use it for any drugs um, that helps young people move towards quit. Thank you for saying that. And then we want teens to understand how to respond in an emergency in addition to calling 911, putting, uh, putting somebody on their side recovery position so that they don't vomit, or if they do vomit, they don't trip choke on that vomit. And then we talk about naloxone, particularly for fentanyl. I carry naloxone in my backpack, my work bag all the time. It's important to have this. I encourage you all to have naloxone. I encourage schools, libraries, bars, anywhere where teens and young adults or anybody is. And it's really important going back to set and setting to encourage young people, encourage them not to use but if they are using to use with other people, because the other problem is that teens are using alone and dying because they didn't realize, or, you know, they didn't know it was fentanyl and nobody's there to help them. On that somber note, I will continue. That was lesson two. Then lesson three, and I'm not going to go as in depth with all the other lessons, but I wanted you to understand the harm reduction point that we have. Lesson three, we talk about drugs and the brain. We, we have a play on words, youth, it's for youth. So we talk about the brain. Um, this is all about the brain, all about how your brain's cool, your brain's developing. It, there's so much good about your brain, but because of the fact that your brain's developing, your brain's figuring out who am I? What do I wanna be in life? Where am I going? What will I ultimately become? That's all awesome. That's all what you're supposed to be doing as a teenager. But because of that, and because of the pruning, your brain gets rid of the, the neuronal connections that you don't need anymore. When that happens, um, you're, you're, you're significantly more likely to become addicted during that process of your brain maturation. And that's why teens and young adults are so much more likely to become addicted. You don't have too many adults, 25 or older, 30 or older, who suddenly start smoking nicotine or, or cannabis or anything who then become addicted still not good for you. I'm not 
trying to say when you're 25, go ahead and use drugs, but it's particularly a problem for teenagers. So we talk about that. Lesson four is on stress and coping. We know young people are stressed, incredibly stressed right now. So we talk about, and when they're stressed, they're more likely to use drugs. So we talk about stress, coping, and wellness, and other ways to talk about stress, other ways to exercise, laugh, do other things rather than use drugs. And, and by drugs, I mean alcohol as well um, with their friends. So we actually, there's this full of activities and exercises to help you breathe and so on. Now we get into the specific drug classes. So we have lesson five is all about stimulants. Lesson six is all about e-cigarettes and vaping. I will tell you if you're interested in this, you can, uh, this is just one lesson, but we also have our you and me together vape free, which is uh, um, five lessons all on e-cigarettes. Uh, this lesson here is just a snippet of those five lessons that we developed as well. Lesson seven is on cannabis. Same thing. If you want a whole set of lessons on cannabis, we have our smart talk curriculum as well. Lesson, um, where am I? Eight is on alcohol and other depressants. We talk about the red cups, if you're not familiar with those. So teens know what is equivalent to a shot, a drink, a, a beer, a bottle, a, a glass of wine. Again, we're not encouraging, but so many teens and young adults go to college or in their high school parties and they get the solo, the red solo cups, and they fill it to the top. And this is something that we're trying really hard not to keep having them do. Lesson nine is all about opioids and fentanyl. Lesson 10 is all on hallucinogens. Then we go back to just a couple of remaining lessons that cut across all drugs. Lesson 11 is on media and refusal skills and media literacy. We have something called the CRAP test. We didn't make that up. CRAP test, C-R-A-P-P, to help adolescents and adults learn how to best read and understand media and social media and ads to know when you're being duped, when somebody's coming after you. Um, we tell teens you're more likely to be targeted because the industry knows if we get you now, we have you for life. We have you addicted. We have you wanting to use our product. So that is a very much a refusal skill that we have in there. We talk about drug policies in lesson 12. And then finally, lesson 13 is a summary. Just a few more quick uh, slides. In addition to that curriculum, we have lots of other free resources and curriculums that I want you to know about. It was already put in the chat, the link to our Reach Lab website. Uh, there's the QR code there. On the left of our website, our lab website, you, there's the tab for preventions and interventions that gets you to all of our curriculums. We have curriculums on e-cigarettes and vaping, on um, cigarettes, on hookah, on smokeless tobacco, on um, cannabis. And then we have the, the, like I said, healthy futures. Now, parents, you can do healthy futures with your kids. Healthy futures is for those who are using to use motivational interviewing, restorative justice to get young people not to use. We also have all kinds of other information for you. We have a parent corner. We're, we're um, just got a little bit of funding. We're looking for more to really make the parent corner a much bigger toolkit for you parents, but there's resources in there. We have resource page and other information. You can also see us having fun and all the research we do there too. So we have infographics like this, addressing the fentanyl crisis, fentanyl facts. And we're gonna do one of these fact sheets or infographics for all the different drugs. We just haven't gotten to them yet. Demand is well higher than what we're able to keep up with, but we are doing our best. We're creating these in other languages too. Um, so we have this. We have also using naloxone and teaching young people how and adults how to use naloxone and how to carry naloxone. We really encourage you and welcome you to print these um, posters, create them poster size, use them around your schools, around your clinics, anywhere you want. They're free. All we ask is that you keep our logo on there so people know that it came from our lab and that was not something you created. We have tips for quitting. Somebody asked about that. We have tips for quitting both nicotine and cannabis. We have a cost calculator in there. 
and lots of resources. And then finally, we do have an entire two-day conference coming up in April, April 17th and 18th. This is the one thing we do charge for. Um, it kind of gives us money for the rest of the year. Uh, but it, everybody keeps telling me it's a steal at $125 for two days. We have about 50 talks going on at once, not just on cannabis, on tobacco, on other drugs, on harm reduction, on on all kinds of information and brain and other health effects and so on. So please consider um, registering if that's something you're interested in. Please follow us on social media. We don't, um, we, we do have a listserv. If you want to join, shoot me an email. Um, but we don't like to, to uh, send more than four, five, six emails a, a year with, with information. So we don't tell you every time we don't email you to say, we just put on a new curriculum or we just updated something. Instead, we put it on social media because literally we are building something new every other day. I would be way too many emails. So please join us on social media, whatever social media poison you prefer, we have it. And there is my email. And I'll put that in the chat as well. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher. That was incredible. Parents at the beginning were like, but are you going to tell us what to do? Well, you told us what to do. That was amazing. Also, everybody who's on with us today, I want you to know that Dr. Halpern Felscher is here tonight pro bono. She won't say it, but I will say it. It's part of her community outreach and it is the Halpern Felscher Reach Lab. So she takes this work really seriously. And these resources are online and they're free. Check them out. Go to the conference. All right, Bonnie, we've got some awesome questions coming in. So let's have at it. Okay. Sounds Here, great. Here's a really good one. Do you have any advice for how to approach other parents about this issue? For example, if my kid's going to a friend's house or an overnight, what are some minimally, confronta minimally confrontational ways to ask about substance use in the home? Oh, that's such great a great question. question. It is such a great question. My cop out solution is have the party at your house. And we did that all the time, I will admit, but I know that's not always um, feasible for you to do. Um, I, I would, one is, I, I, we literally walked into a house once when our kids were little, the parent was not there. We did not let our kid go to the party. And we were pretty good parent, nice parents. They were not going to a party without a parent there. Um, we made sure that we knew the parents. We made sure that we had cell phones of the parents um, and of the kid. We would have a conversation with the parents unless we knew them well about are you monitoring, making sure that there are no drugs going on. When my kids would have a party, we have a, a multi-level house. We'd go downstairs where the kids were and I'd bring them brownies, not laced, just plain old brownies. And I would do, I would space it out so I'd go down and bring brownies then I'd say oh you guys need some carrots and dip oh you guys need a little more water and it was my way of always going down to see how things were going and I would come unannounced um so I would ask parents to do that as well I would have a conversation you need to have community parenting and then you you have to tell the, your kids we're going to have community parenting we're going to be working together on these issues um it's not a perfect solution but those are some of the things I would think about. We will have a lot more of those answers soon because we're going to be building this parent curriculum, as I said, parent information for you um, to help you with some of those. So some more scripts. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. Great answer. Community parenting, everybody. We like that. All right. Here's a question from an educator. Can the curriculum lessons be used piecemeal if teachers have limited time or want to focus on specific issues? Yes. The answer simply is yes. We do not mind. And by the way, we do free trainings on our curriculums. Um, if you email us out, we do not mind if you use one slide, one lesson, use them out of order or whatever. Now, we don't have science to tell us if it makes a difference, though. That I want to make clear. They're evidence-based. They're, they're becoming ev uh, uh, evidence-informed. They're becoming evidence-based based on people using them all the way through. If you change it around, I can't say it is now an evidence-based curriculum. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I feel pretty good that you can do that. Um, so I would encourage that. And, and my lab's happy to work with you to identify the best set of curriculums for you. All right. Thank you for that. 
Really good questions, everybody. Keep them coming. We're going to do as many as we can. Luckily, Bonnie knows everything. So here we go. All right. Do the Good Samaritan laws apply to school-based consequences? For example, if a student calls 911 for help for another student on campus, can they be punished for using or suspended? So somebody else might be better qualified from schools than I am on this one. I will just tell you, having talked to school resource officers who have said to me, if student A has passed out, probably from drugs, student B calls 911 and we police come, in addition to hopefully ambulance and medical team, we come and student B, the one who is not passed out, has drugs on them, we will not arrest them. We will not bust them. They will not get reported. We want to take care of the kid who's who's injured or ill. And, you know, uh, now, can I absolutely guarantee that? Certainly not. There, there are going to be cops who are not going to behave well. There are going to be schools who are not. But that is the best of my understanding of the law. All right. And, you know, um, Bonnie, I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you think that parents and caregivers should have naloxone in the home? I do. I honestly do think that parents should have naloxone in the home. You can actually get it over the counter now. You can also sometimes get it for free. If you email me, I could try to figure out a way to help, help you. I, I would have it. I would. Okay. And also, um, any of you who are in San Mateo County, all of our schools do have naloxone in the schools. So just know that that's part of the county's new drug harm reduction policy. Okay. Um, Bonnie, Asker says, what types of institutions offer the Safety First curriculum? Schools, churches, and how can we find them? Schools are starting to offer it more and more. It's a relatively new curriculum that we've only actually had, I think, six months now. Um, I mean, it's been in existence longer, but we've took, taken it over and been disseminating it. Um, if, if, but I, if the question is, how do you get a hold of it? You've got the link. It's free. It's online. You can use it anytime. It is there for you. If your question is, how do you know if your student is in a school who's using Safety First, I would ask the health education teachers. I'd ask the PE teachers. I'd ask the vice principals. And if they're not using, get them to come get trained because it's totally free and they are welcome to use it. Um, if you're in a specific school area and you want to know if your school is using, you can shoot me an email and somebody in my lab, Scott, knows everyone who's using everything and we could find that out for you because we do have records of who's using it. Okay. Um, two more quickly. Bonnie, it won't surprise you to know that there's some parents here dealing with some really serious stuff. Parent asks, what if you have a teen who's dropped out of school, refuses to abstain, run away from rehab? I attend Al-Anon meetings but my child is barely 18. I don't feel our society has an option or a place for solutions to support a teen addict. You know, um, somebody put this in the chat as well that I, you know, I'm not giving absolute, like here are the five things you can do because yeah. we don't, we don't know. Um, yeah. I sympathize with you all. I empathize. Uh, I, you know, we don't have the perfect solution for every teen. I would say first reach out to an adolescent medicine doc and to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, sometimes you might have to help the child or put the child, your your son or daughter into rehab or into day courses, uh, day programs to get them off drugs. We do not have the, um, it, we really do not have the absolute perfect solution for everybody. Uh, just me, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and just me, I know very well. Hello. And it, it is so hard. Um, this problem again, I feel for you. I was working with a teenager, um, not directly, but, but part of our youth group who was on the national stage to not use, uh, vaping e-cigarettes because he had had lung issues and other things. He was the biggest spokesperson, spokesperson, and about a year later, he relapsed and started using again. And he, this is a kid you thought never would go back because he told everybody not to use. And so I'm not trying to say to to be a downer at you know six thirty on on tonight, but I sympathize. It is so hard. Don't give up. Join groups and just try everything. Public health, um, county departments of public health have alcohol, tobacco, and other drug resources for you. 
go to a psychiatrist. Stanford has an addiction specialist group that you can use. I think UCSF does as well. I know insurance is an issue, so we could do that. If you want to email me, I don't I don't directly treat. Uh, but if you email me, I can also see if I can get our um, psychiatrist to 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 at least get you into their clinic. So I feel for you all. I really do. And I don't mean to come across, hopefully I'm not, that it's a simple solution. It is not. I hear you. It's absolutely not a simple solution. So my heart's are with you all. I know. Thank you for writing, though. Okay, last question, Bonnie. I just want you to be able to clarify here. The writer is asking, do you have a student or teen curriculum? Um, yes and no. We don't have an explicit one. We're building one. It's in our wish list, but we have a lot, a lot, a lot of groups who are taking our curriculums and doing peer-to-peer. -peer. And if you want to do that, we will work with you to tell you which lessons. You, it's not that you have to reinvent anything. It's all there. It's just that we'll work with you to say, Here's how you should use the curriculums to be more peer-to-peer. -peer. The short answer is start with the activities, not with the talk, because the activities are what springboards. And then, you know, you use an activity and then from there you move on to ask, um, to, to the actual, okay, well, you know, this is why we did the activity. Here's the information you should know. Let me help you understand it better. So we do a lot of peer-to-peer. -peer. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer cessation. We are actually building, back to the other question, we are building a peer-to-peer -peer support coaching program, mostly around cannabis and nicotine, but we are building that hopefully in the next couple of months. And that's just going to be for California and that's going to be free. Um, so at least for the time being, we're going to try and see if we can do that. All right. And does the curriculum touch on kids who may be more at risk because there's a family history of addiction? Not as much as we should. I'll be honest, Charlene, we should do more of that. We talk about metabolism a little bit, but it is something that we should do. We are going to be building more, not only for parents to talk to their teens, but for teens to talk to their parents, because a lot of teens know that their parents are using. When you ask mm -hmm. people, have you ever ridden in a, a car with a drunk driver? The majority of the drunk drivers are their parents. So um, we are going to be working on that. There's so much we want to do. And All right. Well, <laughs> Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher, we cannot thank you enough for tonight. You are such a busy person for you taking time tonight to be with us. Thank you, attendees who are with us. This is a tough topic, but I think that we've given you some good practical advice tonight. And again, Bonnie, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the work that you do and for Reach Lab and everybody else. This video will be available soon. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Help your kids stay safe. And we hope to see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone.